When we looked at the discrete time Fourier transform, we used the linear and time invariant system to exemplify the use of the transform. So for an LTI system, we have the relation that if we have an input signal x of n, then the output signal y of n is given by the convolution between this input signal x of n and the function, time discrete function h of n, known as the impulse response of that system. And what the discrete time Fourier transform gave us was an alternative view of such a system, which stated that if we have the discrete time Fourier transform of the input si signal, so we call this transform x of nu here, then the output y of nu, or the transform of the output, is given by the transform of the input times the Fourier transform, or the discrete time Fourier transform of the impulse response, also known as the, as the frequency response of the system. So this gave us, instead of the convolution, a multiplicative view of what the system does to a particular input, and it let us separate this effect in terms of frequencies. However, at the end of the day, when we implement such a system, it's this signal y of n that we try to compute. So the question that we'll try to address in this lecture is, how do we, given an input signal x of n and an impulse response h of n, compute y of n in the most computationally efficient way? So if we look at the two transforms that we have to our disposal, we have the discrete time Fourier transform and we have the discrete Fourier transform. So we see that in the time domain what we want to compute is the convolution between h of n and x of n. And the discrete time Fourier transform states that in the frequency domain we could obtain that by multiplying the Fourier transform of the input signal x of n with the frequency response of the system. The problem is, as we've noted before, that uh, these transform are continuous functions of the parameter ni. So it's unclear how you would compute this, or even if you can compute this, uh, in finite time. Or even work with this directly. So therefore it's very tempting to, instead of using the discrete time Fourier transform, doing the same for the discrete Fourier transform. Since in the, for the discrete Fourier transform, these are just sequences of finite length. And it's trivial to multiply them together numerically to get the result y of k. However, the only problem is that, as we saw previously, if you take the discrete Fourier transform and you multiply in the frequency domain, what you're doing in the equivalent notion in the time domain is a circular convolution, or more precisely an n-point circular convolution if you're working with n-point discrete Fourier transforms. And the circular convolution is not the same as the regular convolution, which is what we wanted to compute to begin with. So what we'll look at in this video, or in the following video as well, is how can we use the discrete Fourier transform as a proxy for working with the discrete time Fourier transform? Or more precisely, when does the circular convolution correspond to the regular convolution? So since it's hard to work numerically with infinite length sequences, we'll make some assumptions for the remainder of this video. So explicitly we'll assume that x of n, the input signal, has length l, meaning that x of n is zero outside of a range of length l. So it's uh, only non-zero for n between zero and l minus one. Similarly, we assume that the impulse response h of n has length m, meaning that h of n is zero outside of this range of length m, meaning that the type of systems that we consider are so-called finite, finite impulse response systems, or FIR filters. And for simplicity, we'll assume throughout that the length of the input signal is longer than the impulse response. And this is just to simplify the exposition somewhat. So let's begin by considering the regular or so-called linear convolution. So in the linear convolution, the convolution is defined through this generally infinite convolution sum involving the signals h of n and x of n. However, if we're dealing with finite impulse response system, as we have assumed, then this infinite sum is mainly made up of zero terms. So there's only, at most, capital M, which is the length of h of m, terms which are non-zero. So what we see is that each particular value of the output could, in principle, be evaluated by spending at most capital M multiplications in order to evaluate this particular sum. The linear convolution sum can be illustrated graphically. So if we look at the definition of the linear convolution being this uh, infinite sum, then we have the signal or the impulse response h of m, and then we have the other the input signal x of m being time reverse and shifted to position n, where n is the output value that we try to compute. So for the particular example, when we have an input signal of length 5 
and we have an impulse response of length 4, we can illustrate it as follows for the computation of the first value or the value of y at n equal to 0. So what we do is we take the impulse response, uh, we write it out on a line like this, we take the input signal x of n, we time reverse that signal and shift it so that the first sample x of 0 overlap, uh, overlaps with h of 0. And then the convolution sum is given by the multiplication by the two sequences h of n and x of n followed by sum. So in the particular case when n is equal to 0, the convolution sum is simply h of 0 times x of 0. When we shift n to be equal to 1, that corresponds to a shift of the input sequence x of n. So in this particular case we see that y of 1 is given by h of 0 times x of 1 plus h of 1 times x of 0. And we can continue like this for the n is equal to 2, for n is equal to 3, and so on. Each case multiplying the sequence h with sequence x, shift to the right place, and summing up all the multiplications. And this will give us all of the values of the convolution sum. If we now turn to the endpoint circular convolution, we see that it's different from the linear convolution in some respects. So for instance, the sum now only runs over a finite number of terms by definition, so capital N terms in this case. We still have the impulse response h of m just as before, and we have the input sequence x, time reverse and shifted, but now with the difference that it's cyclically wrapped around itself by this module operation. So if we look at that graphically for the same example that we had before, so we have an input sequence of length 5, we have an impulse response of length 4, and if we consider the five-point circular convolution, so n here is chosen equal to the length of the input sequence, then we can gra graphically illustrate what the circular convolution does by writing out the impulse response along a line like before. But when writing out x, instead of writing it out towards the left here by time reversing it, we time reverse it but cyclically wrap it around itself back to where it started. So if we evaluate the sum when n is equal to 0 here, we would multiply the values of the impulse response with the corresponding values of x of the input sequence and we would sum up over all terms not multiplied by 0. So if we do this for n equal to 0 to compute the endpoint circular convolution for time 0. So we use uh, y of n notation here in order to differentiate it from the linear convolution. What we see then is that the result that we get will not be equal to the linear convolution in general since we have these additional terms which are not included in the linear convolution. If we now take uh, the value of n and shift it so n is equal to 1, what happens to x of n is that it will be cyclically shifted around to the right. And again, evaluating the convolution sum involves multiplying the values of h with the values of x and summing over the entire range of values. And also in this case we see that it will not be equal to the linear convolution. And we can continue like this for n equal to 2 and n equal to 3. But for n equal to 3 something interesting happens. So here we see that since h of n is strictly shorter than uh, the input sequence x, we have a value of 0 here in the impulse response since 4 is less than 5. We have just one value here. And that, of course, does not need to be multiplied by x of 4, so this term just evaluates to 0. And the remaining terms are actually identical to the terms that appeared in the linear convolution. So for this particular value of n, n equal to 3, the output or the value of the circular convolution is identical or equal to the value of the linear convolution. And the same is true also for n equal to 4. And after n equal to 4, we have computed all of the unique values of the five-point circular convolution. So we just saw that for certain values of the time index n, the value of the circular convolution or the n-point circular convolution will be equal to the value of the linear convolution. So if we now again assume that the length of the convolution or the circular convolution is equal to the length of the input sequence, which is longer than or equal to the length of the impulse response, then for which values of the time index n will the n-point circular convolution be equal to the linear convolution? So will it be for n between 0 and capital N minus m? Will it be for n between capital M minus 1 up to capital N minus 1? Or will it be for n between 0 and capital N minus 1?
the correct answer to the question is option number two. So for values between capital M minus 1 and capital N minus 1, the circular convolution or the n-point circular convolution will be equal to the linear convolution. And we can verify that towards the example that we just saw, where n and l was equal to 5 and where the length of the impulse response was equal to 4. In that particular case, it was when n was equal to 3 or when n was equal to 4 that we had this result, that the circular convolution was equal to the linear convolution. So the thing to realize now is that we don't necessarily have to choose the length of the circular convolution equal to the length of the input sequence. So we could in fact choose the length of the circular convolution n here to be strictly greater than the length of the input sequence. And by doing so, we could potentially increase the number of values for which the circular convolution is equal to the linear convolution. So let's revisit the example that we had when we had an input of length 5 and an impulse response of length 4. But now let's choose the value of n to be equal to 7. So we consider a 7-point circular convolution instead. If we look at this graphically, we would write out the impulse response h like before, but then we've been writing out the in input signal x. We should cyclic wrap it, but we should do so with a period of 7 instead of 5, as in the previous example, which means that the sequence or the sum runs over 7 terms, and we would have x of 5 and x of 6, which would be identically equal to 0, given by the fact that l is equal to 5 or that x have finite length. So for n equal to 0 we see that we would still not get the same value for the circular and the uh, linear convolution because we would have this term here which would be different from the two. But already from n equal to 1 we would see that the difference between the linear and the circular convolution being these terms they all get multiplied by 0 meaning that the result overall will be the same. So in this particular case when we have the seven-point circular convolution, L equal to 5 and M equal to 4, for, from N equal to 1 and upwards, the values of the circular convolution are identical to the ones given by the linear convolution. So we could ask the question, how large do we have to choose N in order for all of the values of the circular convolution to be equal to the linear convolution? And in this particular case, it's sufficient to choose n equal to 8, because then we see that already from n equal to 0, all of the overlap here is multiplied by zeros. So the value of the circular convolution, even though we multiply together terms and sum over everything, most of the terms will be zero. So the terms that contribute to the sum will be the same as those for the linear convolution. So in this particular case, we can graphically verify now that for all of the values of the circular convolution, they will correspond to the values of the linear convolution. So, for the general case, what is the smallest value of capital N for which the values of the circular convolution will be equal to the values of the linear convolution for all time indices N computed by the circular convolution, so N in the range of 0 to N minus 1? Would it be N equal to N? n equal to l, n equal to l plus m minus 1, l plus m, l minus 1 times m minus 1, or l times m. The correct answer to the question is given by option number 3. So as long as n is greater than or equal to l plus m minus 1, it will hold that all of the values for the circular convolutions are equal to the ones of the linear convolutions. And in fact, the circular convolution will compute all of the non-zero values of the linear convolution. So if we compare that in the, to the case considered in the previous example when L was equal to 5 and M was equal to 4, we see that L plus M minus 1 is in this case equal to 8, which is consistent with the example that we just gave. So to summarize, what we've just seen is that we can use the circular convolution to compute the values of the linear convolution, provided that the length of the circular convolution is sufficiently large. Now, the whole point of this exercise is that since the circular convolution corresponds to the multiplication of DFTs, and we have a very fast algorithm for computing the DFT, namely the FFT algorithm, we'll be able to use the FFT algorithm to compute circular convolutions in a very computationally efficient way. And we can use that result to recover the values of the linear convolution, so the output of our filter, then using the FFT algorithm as a main computational tool. And this is what we will look at next.